Hello, hello everyone. I am back home. And my camera is crooked. I don't know why I'm so in about this, but my camera is crooked. Anyway, hello everyone. Welcome to our live plant consciousness commentary on Friday. Oh, it feels so good to be home. I drove all night. For those of you that didn't know, I was away uh, last week. And now I am back home and it feels wonderful, other than it's ridiculously hot. Like when I say ridiculously hot, I mean ridiculously hot, but that's okay. Um, today we're going to be talking about, I don't even know what to call this because it's not really a paper. It's an introduction. Like literally it says introduction to the special section planetarium human vegetable economy, vegetal, not vegetable, vegetal ecologies. I picked this because, um, um, well, when we get into the topic, you're gonna notice exactly why I picked this, because I feel like this is one of those um, kicking off points to the whole conversation around the plant humanities that has so many different directions and is really touching many different areas of study, um, including you know colonialism uh, and just, ecofeminism and many different aspects. Plus, even here they talk about houseplant craze and some other aspects of like modern culture. So I was really excited to go through this because I think it's gonna open us. Now remember, we've been going through from, if you go back and you look at the replays, you'll see that we started in like the early 2000s, 2006, I believe, and we've been going through plant intelligence, plant consciousness, plant humanities papers, um papers conversation pieces editorials all kinds of things of this nature we are now in a period of time this is going this particular one is from 2019 so 2019 2020 2021 is a year our years of massive expansion massive expansion around these topics the reason is because the plant humanity starts to take form plant conscious, not plant intelligence, um, some aspects of plant intelligence finally enter into the okay general acceptance. Plant consciousness is now becoming a common discussion point and phrase and topic of conversation and exploration. And there is enough to warrant a um, discussions that that go beyond like basically some areas of the social sciences and of other areas that like the philosophies that are able to say okay we now ex we're just going to put and say we accept this definition regardless of whether or not some of the scientific folk are really still arguing about this but because we agree that you know plants have consciousness plants have intelligence plants have sentience plants have some special mojo that makes them alive and aware, which we already knew, honestly, but because that all exists, then now we can move forward from there and we can start looking at other areas. And this is kind of one of those, <coughs> one of those um, papers that starts to go in this. Now we've seen some uh, work by the authors here. So um, we had a, already have had a few brushes with things like ecofeminism and such, so you can go back again, like through the replays and find that. But this one in particular sets the stage for what's going to happen. So that's the reason why I wanted to stop here and read this introduction together, because I feel like it's going to open up to what I have planned next. Now, in the upcoming papers, I have like whole journals, whole sections, um, um, whole like there's many more journals coming out. There's many more kind of sections of journals coming out. There's areas on the web that are starting to develop from this period going forward around the idea of the human vegetal, <coughs> excuse me, that's not a nice thing to do to cough into the microphone. <coughs> and unfortunately, I don't even have my water with me right now. Anyways, this is really going into the human vegetal relationship relation and taking it in a step further into what looks what does sentience really start to look like in the sense of how do we as humans interact with the vegetal world when we recognize that sentience? Now, we here in NCC as frauds, we've been having these discussions for a long time. And I think we're actually, um, 
I don't want to say a step ahead. I think we're in a kind of slightly different discussion, which is the other reason why I wanted to read this together, because I feel like this is going to take it into kind of a global um, academic language that is useful to help then bring that into the conversations that we have here in NCC, which are very much tied to everyday living and everyday life. Like, I love the concepts that we're going to touch on here. I've only briefly read through a few pieces of this because I just wanted to double check that it was appropriate for what we were working on. I tend to not read the papers because I, um, beforehand I want to read them together with you. And at the same time, I feel like it's, it's going to give us um, a greater insight into what the overall academic and world sphere could look like when we look at it from an ecospheric thinking. And then we can take that and bring that into our conversations in NCC as we always do that are much more detailed and specific, much more about daily living, about what I can do, my projects, my, my clothing choices, my aspects of my interactions with, my, with the plants that share this um, space with me. So I feel like we're still one step into more of the day-to-day, -day, which is necessary. There are no spaces online like NCC where we can have these conversations, and I'm very happy that we have them here and that we're looking at how do we um, partner with plants, how do we co-create with plants, how do we not just look at the models that the plants um, offer us or the mentorship that the plants offer us, but also as what are the partnerships that they offer us and the, the measures and what happens when I start to do things with plants. Now, I have to say, sneak peek, very sneak peek, like this is gonna come in the future. I have seen some recent papers come through. I have so many papers that I wanna go through with you. I've been debating whether or not I'm going to add another day of the week where we go through these because there are just so many, but, um, I have seen some very recent papers that are finally talking about something that I talked about probably about 10 years ago now as a potential direction that I wanted to go with um, some like higher education studies, which is the idea of real co-creation, like literally asking the plant for support and getting insight from a plant and working with. There's some stuff coming down the pipes in this, but we're, we're still not there because we're in 2019 right now. And I think it's just time for us to dive into this. So let me share, we share my screen. Share, share my screen. All right, we are going to, here we go. So here we have this paper, this is um, in, Catalyst, so feminism theory and techno science. Like I said, we have read a paper before and we have commented on a paper from this. This is a really interesting journal because it is taking us out of the realm of plant science where we've been recently and we have been mostly looking at um, information around what is plant consciousness, what is plant intelligence, and how do we measure, how do we understand all of those, what are the comparisons with neurobiology. So we've been in a very kind of hard sciences perspective. Now we're going to step back into sort of more of the humanities, the philosophies, feminism, and this techno science specifically is what makes this paper really unusual, this journal really unusual is that it is looking at science from a different perspective than what we've been looking at before. So this is um, an introduction. So this is the beginning of a whole section of information around human vegetal relations. And so I'm just going to read this. In this introduction is still 13 pages, so it's not a short introduction, but it is still just an introduction um, that we're going to go through. Now, this is called Special Section, Plantarium, Human Vegetal Eco uh, Ecologies. Remember, we have talked in the past about the herbarium, which is, you know, pressed flowers, and it is herbariums were absolutely super critical at a time for um, understanding how the plant body worked was really difficult to do because we didn't have the technology that we have today. So herbariums have been places of studies for biologists, for um, also painters, for um, people that were looking to be inspired by plants that they couldn't physically connect with because the plants didn't grow in their local environment or it was too difficult to travel in that time. So herbariums have been an extremely important aspect of study, even though mm, they killed the plant in order to put it into the, in order to put them into the herbarium. But 
We're going to ignore that for a second because, you know, we've evolved. We're in different places. So here is the introduction of the idea of a planetarium, and we're going to talk about what that really means. This is by Mariana. I am not even going to attempt to pronounce that last name because I am probably going to butcher it. And Olga, same thing, because I will probably butcher it. So um, again, we have read their work by them before. So I am actually really excited about this because I, I like the way that they think. Let me see if I can get this. Mm, let me see what happens if I do. Uh, okay. So hopefully this is a little bit easier to read. All right. So plants are everywhere, but people tend to take little notice of them. Mm, something we know well. While environmental reports warn about the largest loss in plant biodiversity to date, including often undocumented or overlooked extinction of many plant species, Houseplants experience a revival in urban cultures. Huge and glossy leaves of Monsera deliciosa and fiddle leaf figs, Ficus lairata, funky plant, pancake plant, Pailea, pepero, peperomiodis, peperomiodis, and spoon leaved peperomia, peperomia, oh, you say that three times fast, peperomia, uh, along with cacti and air plants, Telancia. Uh, fill millennial urbanites shoebox apartments, shoebox size apartments, and their Instagram feeds. According to the U.S. Natural, National Gardening Association, houseplant sales have doubled between 2016 and 2019, growing a thriving industry worth 1.7 billion. The so-called plant fluencers, with, believe it or not, I'm actually not a plant fluencer. Isn't that amazing to think? I'm not considered a plant fluencer. You know why? Because a plant fluencer just does pretty pictures and talks about the plants and talks about plants a little bit as an object. And this is another discussion that I would like to have. Um, maybe we can bring that up in the next ice sprouts uh, discussion, because I think that might be a really interesting discussion. When we do our next ice sprouts gathering, we can talk about plant fluencers and the idea of are plant fluencers actually good? good in the sense of are they a force that's pushing forward the idea of this deeper reconnection with plants as beings or are they more of the consumer craze gone wild and yes it's good because it is connecting people to plants but but still it's still just consumer let me buy something keep them very pretty and such i don't know it's a good question the so-called influencers with hundreds of thousands of followers on social media and signed book deals, again, not me, shape this recent horticultural fascination by creating trending plants. There are different interpretations of this generation's turn to plants. It may be a way to reconnect with nature, a response to growing anxieties about climate change, or part of the blooming wellness industry. Some see caring for green companions as a substitute for delayed parenthood plants becoming the new pets for city dwellers. In times of environmental and economic insecurities and precarious labor conditions, when few can afford a large garden, many look for, the com for comfort and community in planting and watering their potted houseplants, sharing cuttings, or tending to community gardens or urban farms, which, you know, all listed pretty positive. These intimate human vegetal ecologies, however, are entangled with a long history of colonial scientific expeditions, imperialism, economic extraction, capitalist accumulation, globalization, and cultural appropriation that form the invisible roots which ground and anchor popular decorative houseplants in our spaces. This is the elephant in the room. The fact that many of the plant names and the way that these plants were actually brought into our home was through colonialization and what happened when scientific expeditions would go in and take out plants from their native environments and move them and name them and take away and strip them of their indigenous culture and their indigenous ha habitats and also their indigenous wisdom. Um, are the houseplants that we have, most of them, the I apologize to all of you around me. Okay, the stupid versions of our of of our plant friends because they have been stripped. Are they orphans? 
because they have been taken out of their environment and therefore stripped of their understanding of what it means to be a wild plant with indigenous wisdom, with natural long-standing history. These are all the questions that from 2019 going forward start to open up in the landscape of the humanities and the plant humanities. And they're fascinating discussions because it's not just talking about climate change and environmental factors. It is talking about things like imperialism. It's talking about what is the economic value and place on a being of nature. It's talking about the cultural appropriation of a plant that has been connected into a landscape and is part of a community and is ripped from that and stripped of his name and given a completely different culture because some pardon me for saying this, white dude thought it was nice to have the plants home with them with their some name that they could pronounce. So it's a fascinating kind of new way of entering into the discussions that we have been having in other, in other contexts, but with a more natural slant, slant and a natural, natural understanding. As a result of these historical processes, oftentimes what comes to be considered a decorative plant in one geographical context bears different cultural meanings and functions in its local context. In this sense, the spatial notions of proximity and distance are collapsed in individual stories of plant circulation, at the same time espousing seedy temporalities of global plant travels. How much do consumers actually know about the potted plants that decorate windowsills and bookshelves, populate their houses and flats, and frequently give, given as host gifts? How have these exotic and now domesticated and familiar plant species ended up in people's homes and offices? And this is a question that that's why I was asking originally as to whether the houseplant craze is really creating connection. Because if it created connection, then you would expect these people to go and research where these plants come from and also understand their boundaries, not become so obsessed with succulents that you're willing to go into protected forests and lands and areas that have these for these the few species left of some of these plants and pull them out of the ground in order to be able to take them home, sell them for a super high profit and keep them in a collection that says, oh, this is yours. Mind you, last year I actually purchased a lithos. A lithos is a desert plant. If anybody's ever seen it, some people call it like the butt plant. It, it's, um, you know, lithos is a plant that is meant to be in desert temperatures. The only reason I actually purchased this lithos is because I had a super, this was part of Nurture Your Nature last year, my uh, retreat that happens here in Dominher. And I went with my group, the group, we all went to this wonderful florist show and we had a conversation with the owners. We asked questions of the people that were selling the plants and we asked them hard questions. Why these plants? Where do they come from? What is the history? What is your relationship to these plants? And it was fascinating to see who was just doing it because a plant is something that you grow and sure you love and stuff like that but there is no there is no recognition of the plants as an individual being versus those that say this is the relationship that i have the plants guide me through this i work with these particular types of plants even though i know that this is not their native location for whatever reason that really you could tell there was a deep and connection to letting the plant thrive in the plant's own way in the environment in which the plant currently found themselves. And I, I, that was the only reason. The only plants I purchased there came from people that I had these discussions with that were enriching, that were connective, that were, it was, it was wonderful. And, and there was plenty that had other kinds of relationships for them. So I say this because I think that this is, for us, especially as sprouts, this is the direction we want to take. We want to ask those card questions and we want to ask ourselves, when I want that tropical plant in my house, why am I doing it? What is my motivation and what is in the best interest of this plant? So, sorry, my rant, you know me in this topic, it's one of those. <laughs> so, let's consider one of today's most prominent plant celebrities, Monstera Deliciosa. The characteristic fenestra, uh, fenestrated leaves of this tropical epiphyte became a design inspiration and home decor staple. 
It's true. Does everybody know what plant we're talking about? Like, I'm going to stop my sharing, but let me go and look for. Oh, okay, let's show you a picture because, you know, I think most of you should know, but there are some people who maybe do not know what we're talking about. That's a giant. I don't want a giant. Okay, so let's go with just a simple. A uh, simple, and even with a price, this is perfect. Like, I just want to show it with price tag because, okay, let me share my share. Sure, that's what I want to do. Okay, here we go. Our beautiful Monserrat Deliciosa. Deliciosa, look at that. Oh, go away. $69.95 of euros for this plant and tells you everything about the plants. So, you know, basically now a commodity. All right. So now you know who we're talking about. All right. Let me go back to share my what we were doing before. Okay. So uh, its Latin genus ref name refers to the monstrous size these co uh, conspicuous climbers can reach. While the species owes a specific epithet delicious to its edible fruits considered a delicacy in Mexico and Panama. Let's just stop right there. How many of you knew the Monsera Deliciosa, that plant that we just saw, actually has fruit that was edible? We're starting right there. It tells you how much we're disconnected from the actual plant. Uh, the Spanish and Portuguese vernacular names Costilla de Adán and Costela de Adao, respectively, compared the perforated leaves to the ribs of Adam, a religious reference reminiscent of the European conquest of Latin America. Colonial extraction of natural resources in the New World, including collecting, taxonomizing, naming, describing, and illustrating local flora. These activities made botanical science into one of the central pillars for the economy and politics of the empire throughout establishing global networks of scientists, collectors, merchants, and institutions. The first specimen of Monsera de Deliciosa was collected in 1832 in Mexico by Hungarian-born German botanist Wilhelm Friedrich Karwinski von Karwin. I get to say lots of fun names here who sent a sample to the Munich Botanical Garden where it attracted no attention. A decade later, two other plant collectors introduced Monsera Deliciosa to Europe independently. Danish botanist Frederick Michael Liebman, Liebman yeah, brought live material from Mexico to the University of Copenhagen, while Polish botanist Josef Warsetwitz See, I can't pronounce those, but you know, you got what I'm trying to say. Collected cuttings in the Belgian colony in Guatemala and delivered them to the Berlin Botanical Station. According to Michael Madison, most of the Monsera Deliciosa cultivation originates from these two introductions, which contributed to the huge horticultural triumph of this species starting in the mid 19th century and lasting until today. Although dumb came, dumb came, yeah, I read that right, dumb came. Uh, Diefenbachia may not be as popular as Monsera with its dramatic leaves and big presence. Okay, this means that now we have to go see who this person is. Who is this plant person? Ah, yes. All right, hold on. Let's just make sure we know who we're talking about here. I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to pick one here. There we go. We have a little better homes and gardens. Okay. No, I don't like that one. Sorry. We're trying to find a good one here because, you know, I've got to show you a good picture, one that really makes sense. Um, here we go. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Diffenbach, yeah. So let's share so that you can take a look at... And believe it or not, this is by Miracle Grow. I mean, I don't know how I ended up with Miracle Grow, but this is Diffenbachia. And so here are the leaves. Here's Miracle Grow. Don't use Miracle Grow, by the way. Here we go. There is Miracle Grow. Don't add Miracle Grow. But we get an idea of which plant we're talking about now. 
So, all right, let's go back to our paper. Going back. Okay. Although Dunking, Diffenbachia, may not be as popular as Moncero with its dramatic leaves and big presence, it remains nonetheless a popular ornamental plant due to its attractive foliage, dark green and dotted with white spots and flecks, and resistance to shade. Native to tropical climate, from Mexico to West Indies, it is known to indigenous inhabitants of Upper Amazon and the Caribbean, and the Caribbean as, a medical, as a medicine and a poison. By the way, are you starting to notice a trend here? Most houseplants are originally tropical plants. So when you have a spider plant, a snake plant, or mother-in-law's tongue, when you have a Diffenbachia, dumb cane, or when you have a Moncera in your house, and you live in like the north or any place that is cold for large periods of time in the year, the reason you have these as indoor houseplants is because your home temperature tends to be relatively stable. So you tend to keep a temperature that's, you know, not too hot, not too cold, because you want to be comfortable in your house. So they become the hat. But this means that they have been completely taken out of their native lands in many cases in order to do this, just, just to kind of remember. But once Dumb King's toxic qualities were discovered by Europeans, it led to multiple abuses. Dumb King was used by slave, I don't like this name Dumb King, so I'm going to call him Diffenbachia. Divinbakia was used by slave owners and traffickers to punish Jamaican enslaved people by rubbing their mouths with cut stems, causing swelling and corrosive burns in the mouth, larynx, esophagus, and stomach of a victim. Ew, ew. Later, upon discovering that the plant caused sterility in animals, a, long, a quality long known to indigenous peoples in areas where Divinbakia was native, a Nazi doctor, Adolf Pokorny, luckily later tried in Nuremberg, suggested that it be used in sterilization experiments conducted on concentration camp prisoners. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Another horticultural favorite, succulents, arguably one of the most hipster plants, have recently found themselves at the center of a smuggling controversy. I was talking about this earlier. The definition of a succulent includes plants that possess at least one succulent tissue, that is, a living tissue that has the ability to store water, giving the plant the ability to survive in arid climates. There are over 10,000 species of succulents, wide, widely varying in size, shape, and flowers. Among them, Dudleia farinosa became popular, particularly popular among indoor plant enthusiasts who value its bizarre growth form, its bizarre growth form with an adorable thick pale green leaves. All right, all right, all right. Yes, I'm going to check. Let's see who we are. Let's go and see who we are. Hold on. Give me one sec, folks. We will find you. Oh, oh, we have a lot of those around here. Okay, uh, hold on. Let me find a really cute picture so that we can see this. Oh, look, and I, I just, all right, you'll see when I, when I hit the website that I found. Look at what the website's called, gardenia.net. Not great. Anyways, here we are. Dudleia farinosa, bluff lettuce. Isn't that adorable? So cute. So cute. Okay. All right, let's go back to our paper. Okay. Uh, among them, Dudleia farinosa became particularly popular among indoor plant enthusiasts who value its, not its, Keys, bizarre growth form with adorable thick pale green leaves. <laughs> Their popularity also attracted plant poachers who snatch it from the coast of California and ship the plant overseas. Grrr. Journalists and locals mourn the loss of wild growing coastal plant life harvested by poachers to saturate the high demand of global markets as the craze for these tiny and drought friendly plants grows, particularly in South Korea and China. And yet their concern may not only may be not only over the loss of biodiversity 
Anxieties over Asian markets' insatiable demand for succulents may also be reflecting something about the U.S. determination to retain its status as an economic megapower, which is now seriously threatened by China's growing markets. These individual plant stories reveal, a deep political, reveal deep political entanglements between the history of botany, capitalist markets, and multiple uses of plants in veterinary and medical sciences. In a conversation featured in this issue, Canadian environmental and literary scholar Katriona Sandilands, by the way, the other paper that we had read by these same authors was an, an interview that they did of Katriona Sandilands. So it's a very interesting one you can go back and listen to because it really touches on many topics that we, we just have yet to dive fully into. It highlights the critical importance of context, tracing the concrete situated stories of particular people's relations with particular species of plants in specific places and historical moments. From this perspective, plants are, to use Circle Oppenman's formulation, densely storied matter. Densely storied matter. Interesting. I need to think about that term. Burgeoning new research on the vegetal helps understand the intertwined histories of humans and plants. Humans depend on the vegetal world in a fundamental way for food, animal feed. Really, the second one is animal feed. For food, animal feed, medicines, clothing, fuel, and shelter intoxication and stimulation, as well as mediating deep cultural and social meanings flourishing in arts and aesthetics. Interesting list. Plants for their part use humans as pollinators to colonize new territory. That is true because plants are clever. Plants grow deeply into human histories, stories of knowledge and resistance retained in women's indigenous and other vernacular knowledges about herbs, healing plants, and natural methods to induce miscarriage. Stories about violence, domination, and conquest, inseparable from the history of cultivation and trade in rice, sugar, cane, spices, cotton, rubber, and so on. Plants played a fundamental role, and, and I'm going to stop for a second just because I, we often talk about plants, especially here at NCC, we talk about from one context, plants as in like the trees that we see in a forest, the grasses under our feet, the house plants that we have around us. On the other hand, we might talk about, you know, cotton fibers and trees that are used for furniture, such as the table that I'm at right now. But we also have to remember the entire part of history of cultivation and trade and also of colonization relating to all of the foods that we eat. Right, all of those plants like rice and sugarcane and spices that are coming from various plants that we have completely dominated all the agricultural perspective. And sometimes when we say agriculture, it's very easy for us to just picture, you know, rows of agriculture. But when we think about things like sugarcane and cotton and rubber, that is also because of agriculture has been completely dominated and not let the human vegetal relationship is no longer a natural one for many reasons, right? It is unnatural because it is one of domination rather than of cooperation and reciprocity. You know, similar to the words of Robin Wall Kimmerer in her various books, including Braiding Sweetgrass, the idea that we have lost reciprocity. So we have lost that relationship and that contact. And therefore we've lost that nourishment that is goes beyond just the physical, um, vitamins and minerals that something might have. So, so we have to stop sometimes and think to ourselves that when we are talking about the plant world and the human vegetal interactions, we are talking about so much more that sometimes it's hard for us to conceptualize. And so it's good to take that time every once in a while to stop and kind of give that space, that respect to all the other aspects of plants that we might not recognize. I just went away and I accidentally left a cucumber in my refrigerator. When I came back, of course, that cucumber was more than non-edible. And as I was putting in the compost, I was putting this cucumber into the compost bin, I was stopping and thinking about my own feeling of you know waste and of not respecting the life that that cucumber gave and all these different aspects of it so it is important for us to think of everything when you open your spice cabinet everything when you open so much of when you open your um 
your your clothing, your armoire, your closet, you know, all these types of things are those plant relationships. And so just taking a moment to sort of step into that as much as possible is always a good thing because that's how we're going to get to that better awareness and that relationship when we do take a moment to just respect that and also ask ourselves, what is our reciprocity? What is it that I can give back to this environment? Okay. Uh, plants played a fun, where am I? Plants played a fundamental role in the colonization of Americas and slavery and colonial botany, the study naming, cultivating, and marketing of plants in colonial contexts was born of and supported European voyages, conquests, global trade, and scientific exploration. By the 18th century, plants had the status of green gold, a currency as crucial for political and economic expansion as Western European states as gold or silver, revealing the volatile nexus of political science, of bot botanical science, commerce, and state politics. And none is more obvious than this than the tulip trade. Right? Everything relating to the tulip trade is a oh, fantastic experience of how an ornamental, beautiful plant became a massive currency for an entire, you know, entire country of people and massively traded and still massively traded and kind of, you know, that whole concept of a green gold or a multicolored gold in the sense of tulip flowers. I mean, it's fascinating to see just how important we have um, we have been able to give that prominence to plants, but still almost always as objects, kind of like we think of gold itself, like gold itself, inert, uh, not alive, notwithstanding that it is a mineral and all these different aspects, and we think of plants in the same way. What happens when we change that narrative? Where are we going and what should we become when we move out of that narrative? By the 18th century, plants had, uh, see, wait, sorry, I just repeated that. In the 20th century, the Green Revolution seemingly reversed these colonial roots through implementing research and technology, transfer aimed at increased agricultural production in the so-called developing world through promoting high yielding crop varieties, agrochemicals, mechaniz mechanization, and Western methods of cultivation at the expense of traditional ways of farming and biodiversity, which of course is also more removed from the plant again, objectifying the plant rather than creating a relationship. And if you go back and look at the, you know, some of the replays and you look at the replay of the feminist plant, the water lily, that's another fascinating comparison of how we as plants, I mean, how we have objectified women very similarly to the way we've objectified plants and vice versa. And therefore that is the control. So as we break out, as we ourselves as women break out of some of the cultural um, bindings that have hold us, held us in place, we are also giving space for plants to also break out of their cultural boundaries. Um, this rich history of human-plant relationships may prove crucial to understanding and reflecting on our contemporary historical and political movement. For example, Anna Singh suggests we call our present epoch the plant, plantati, planta, planta, Planta science scene, plantation, no, plantation scene. Plantation scene. You tell me how you would pronounce that. So we had the anthropos, the anthros, but now I'm like, now I've said it so many times, I'm all confused. Planta or plantation, no, plantation, plantation scene. I'll let you pronounce it. You pronounce it however you want. <laughs> Uh, serving as the engine of European expansion, plantation, plant, yeah, plantations produced immense wealth and replaced more sustainable relationships between humans and plants when, with enslaved or otherwise coerced labor. Donna Haraway echoes this statement in saying that the order of, of a plantation configures, so they, then is it plantation of scene? Plantation of scene. We're going to go with plantation of scene. Okay. Uh, blah, blah, blah. The order of a plantation configures the most symptomatic elements that, for over the last 500 years, have been shaping our planetary system. Among them, radical simplification, substitution of peoples, crops, microbes, and life forms, forced labor, and, crucially, the disordering of times of generation across species, including human beings. 
The dramatic environmental change we are currently experiencing is an effect of structurally unjust social relations epitomized by exploitative, and econo by exploitative economy of the plantation. So today, as species of the plants and communities, so today, as species of plants and communities of people are being forced out of their homes and habitats by droughts, floods, forest fires, polluted waters, and toxic wastes, plant life lies central to questions brought by rapid environmental change and shapes agenda issues such as migration due to climate change, belonging to a place that may be endangered, and loss of species and habitats. For example, gender studies scholar and plant biologist Banu Subramanian shows how fears over immigration and globalization seep into invasive biology discourses around invasive and alien species of plants that, it is said, spread uncontrollably, pushing out the natives. In a different context, Polish multimedia artist Karolina G studies weeds as historical and political documents as they grow in villages abandoned because of forced migration and ethnic displacement in southern Poland. These so-called rural species are the first to colonize areas disturbed by wildfires or human activity, thriving in capitalist ruins and helping us live on, an, on a damaged planet. When I was doing my master's degree, one of the subject matters that I loved so much, I mean, we were, you know, plants, social innovation design, there was so much in there, but it was plant, um, it was it was really about um, archaeology and plant informed archaeology. When we think about an archaeological, archaeological site, so you go to any kind of ruin, most likely it has been completely cleaned and devoid of all plants which if you think about it when they're in their restoration work they clean out everything that is a plant but it actually makes no sense to do that because in the context in which that ruin that original building was built of course there was thriving plants all around and the plants informed many of the decisions that were made around that particular structure so it's not the human made structure that is the archaeological find sometimes but it is the interaction between both the plants of the time with the creation of the structure, and then the plants that have survived or that have continued to thrive in that area going forward, and the interaction of what they have created, oftentimes holding up the walls through the way that the plant roots grow into the walls, holding up the structures, keeping that memory alive. And what do humans do? The first thing they do, clear it all out makes no sense whatsoever. We lose giant parts of the history. Even when I was in Egypt, I had a big conversation with our guides. Um, you, know, I, you might know that I go to Egypt almost every year over the last few years um, and, you know, taking groups and I don't take groups, but my partner takes groups. So, um, but the point being is like, I had a big conversation with our guides and asked like, where are all the plants? And they, he, he was very honest. He was like, we ripped them out excuse me? He's like, we ripped them out. I'm like, why? And he's like, because they attract water. And I'm like, do they attract water or do they find the water that's there? And he's like, well, it doesn't matter because it's water and then that might destroy the ruins. I'm like, we have lush landscapes at the time that things like the pyramids and Giza were all created. The Nile used to overflow. It was a lush landscape that has now become a desert and we are contributing to the desertification by pulling out plants and not allowing this skate landscape to create its, you know, its own environment again. It's, it's just wild. It's wild the way we try to control plants and the fear that we have of what plants can really show us and how plants can really um, help us create natural landscapes. Like, it's just amazing. Uh, through attending to vegetal matter, this matter, this special section of Catalyst, Feminism, Theory, and Technoculture, Planetarium, Human Vegetal Ecology, articulates question around plant-human encounters in their storied, historical, scientific, biotechnological, political, discursive, biological, and ecological context. For us, as guest editors of this section, and for the editors of Catalyst, 
the task to approach the botanical realm from the perspective of feminist technoscience seemed timely and important. This is 2019, by the way. First of all, because the study, collection, and use of plants is a particularly gendered affair. By the 18th century, botany was one of the few scientific disciplines open to women with many prominent female botanist collectors, illustrators, and experts. And second, because from Linnaeus taxonomy, for those who don't know, Linnaeus taxonomy is the taxonomy that we see the scientific name of plants in Latin that was developed by Linnaeus. And so everything that is about taking out the original indigenous names and putting these often colonized names um, comes from Linnaeus. Thank you very much. Or not. Um, Taxonomy, an invention of botanical nomenclature to today's bioengineered plants, uh, genetically modified tree and seed databases. <sighs> plants open to us, open up space to critically reflect on the ways in which knowledge is produced, classified and organized in science. Following in this epistem ep uh, epistemological vein, we must also recognize the sites of plant knowledge production outside of Western science as created by indigenous peoples, enslaved and colonized people, and in, botan in popular botanical, medicinal, and pharmaceutical knowledge. From yet another perspective, contemporary research in plant science that concerns vegetal cognition, sentience, and, com and communication. So this is where our worlds intersect. Um, see Mancuso and Viola, which is brilliant green, by the way, and Simard in her book. Um, well, actually, that's not her book, actually. That's her paper on, um, on mother trees. Invites critical perspectives that challenge the historically inherited Western hierarchy of the human, the animal, and the vegetal life. We also wanted to capture a particular moment in which the humanities and arts renewed interest in plant life gives rise to a new and fertile field of study known as critical plant studies. Now, this is the birth of the plant humanities. Now, remember, the arts in plants was really more still life in the past. The idea of capturing the beauty of the plants, but not telling the plant story. Today, the humanities has really expanded out and unhelping us working with art. And this is the reason why we work so much with art here in NCC is because we want to use art to tell the story, to help us reimagine what a future can be. What does the paradigm shift look like? What does it taste like? What does it feel like? Because it's going to be very difficult for us to put that into words. It's going to be difficult for us to put it into um, traditional imagery of still life. This is about abstract. This is about terminology and thinking of our relationship with plants as cohabitants, as co-creators of our planet, as, as equal partners in Earth. What does that look like and feel like and smell like and taste like and all those different pieces requires the arts to get us out of a logical mind. The other day in the Naturally Conscious Leadership Group uh, group mentoring call that we do once a month for people for all of the flourishing sprouts, in that call we had a very big conversation about what does the next wave of business look like when we get out of the rules that we have today. And many of my clients, that is exactly what we're working on. We are working on getting you out of the traditional norms and rules and definitions of what business should look like in order for you to create authentic, interrelated, entangled, uh, co-creative business structures that allow you to step into your natural intelligence, that allow you to bring plants in as co-collaborators, that allows you to really create in a whole different way the new version of the future that we want to create. And that's really the focus that we want to go in here. So these types of papers are extremely important to push the envelope and to put this into a sphere that reaches a mass audience, right, through the humanities, through this critical plant studies. Crisscrossing feminist and queer scholarship, art and literature, anti-colonial and critical race theories, information studies, history of science, and science and technology studies, critical plant studies forges new research paths for thinking with plants, I like that with, as a way of repositioning the human in the surrounding natural, cultural environment and human vegetal knowledge. Drawing on history of science, 
feminist science and technology studies, and plant science, critical theories of plants problem problematize plant-human relationships in the context of power relationships running along the lines of race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexuality, nationality, and more. Now, I'm sure when I've read that writ list, you have been thinking of humans. Race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexuality, nationality, and more. I'm going to reread the list, and I want you to, for a second, just close your eyes and think and listen and think plant. What comes to mind when I think of race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexuality, nationality, and more connected to plants, as plants, with plants. Already see how that starts to shift the narrative, how it's shifting the conversations that we need to have. Oh, I love it. Emerging fields of research such as plant philosophy, queer ecologies, phytopoetics, multi-species ethnogra ethnographies, Ethnograph ethnographies, yeah. environmental humanities, food studies, studies on the Anthropocene or the Planthropocene. See, Planthropocene I can see better than Plantationocene. Planthropocene, that I get. Among others, look into plant life to further explore constellations of knowledge, matter, and power in which both plants and humans are entangled. At the same time, we see all around us multiple and creative practices emerging from urban activism, grassroots community building, indigenous and communal knowledges, and artistic experimentations that reclaim the power to produce knowledge about plants and redefine intimate human plant relations. In an effort to heal the wounds of inflicted by regimes of colonization, imperialism, imperialism homo and transphobia, misogyny, and racism. Again, listen to all those words and think also plant, human, think of persons, persons, human persons, plant persons, micro persons. It just changes the entire story so much. The individual contributions to this special section take up this challenge, each in a different fashion, illuminating the importance of intersexual and situated analysis for feminist plant studies. In other words, this collection offers innovative feminist, queer, and decoded decolonial, man, I struggle with words sometimes, decolonial, oop, sorry, I accidentally clicked some bit. decolonial methodologies for theorizing the vegetal turn in the human, in the humanities and arts. One example of such artistic experimentation is plant-centered design by Spella, I think, and I'm not even going to try Petrus. A Slovenian new media artist and former scientific researcher whose work extensively engages plant life. Oh, I gotta, gotta write that name down. The cover image of this issue features a cyclamen from, the, from her plant sex consultancy series in which the artist, along with Hei Ying Li, Dimitris Stamatis, and Jasmina Weiss designed and produced devices suited for specific plants to enhance their natural reproductive strategies. This kind of technological inter intervention serves on the one hand as a medical pro 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 uh, prosthesis developed in response to the drastic decline in insect pollinators, while on the other functions as a floral sex toy for potted plants to overcome their isolation and apparent immobility. So I have to let that sink in. Floral sex toy for potted plants to overcome their isolation and apparent immobility. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to go check that out afterwards. Do we have something? Plant, hold on, okay. Let's, let's see what we were talking about. Plant sex consultancy series. Because I know that you, you've gotta be curious like I'm curious, okay? So, It's not as exciting as it might seem. Hold on, I'm looking for it. Okay, let me share, let me stop sharing this and let me share that. Okay, so we have plant sex consultancy employs design methodologies to create augmentations for its vegetal clients, which supplement and enhance their natural reproductive strategies.
I don't know. I was looking for a little something a little bit more sorted. Oh, that one's interesting. Look at that. Look at that. Okay, some of these are kind of cute. I mean, this is this is a sex shop for plants. So if you've never seen a sex shop for plants, ooh. Is that some kind of plug? Okay, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop because if I keep going on this path, I don't know where I'm gonna go. And that's not fair to you. But I do think that that's fascinating. So I'm gonna go check that out afterwards. I left it open. Okay. We open this collection with Joella Jacobs' Phytopoetics, upending the passive paradigm with vegetal violence and eroticism. What is the obsession with eroticism? I mean, don't get me wrong, I have no problem with it. I'm just curious. This wonderfully intertextual essay offers a foray into vegetal, vegetal eroticism in plant reproduction, linking botany to early sexology. Illustrated with examples from German Art Nouveau imagery and narratives that attributed erotic qualities to plants. Jacobs offers a concept of phytopoetics to capture the political, cultural, and poetic agency of the plant. Jacobs convincingly shows how human notions about sex and violence, about making life and ending it, are projected onto the vegetable realm. That is true, showing that phytopoetics engages with some of the most central anxieties of modern society since the sustained survival of the human species depends on plants. Ooh, that looks really interesting. Feminist technoscience scholar, would you love that title? I'm a feminist technoscience scholar. I think that's a pretty cool title. Nina Leike. In her article, Co-Becoming with Diatomes, I almost did a project with diatomes once, um, between post-human mourning, post-human mourning and wonder and algae research, reopens the questions of temporal schemes of life, death, and survival in the Anthropocene. Leike offers a deeply personal portrayal of her queer grief that is entangled with the non-human life, plants, rocks, and seawaters. But above all, with diatomes, single-celled aquatic algae that possess characteristics of both plants and an animal, escaping taxonomic categories, diatomes question discrete and anthropocentric notions of human selfhood, life and death, harm and survival. By, become, by means of becoming with algae, like it offers a meditation on post-human mourning in face of personal losses and mass species extinctions and calls for an expansion on the limits of our empathy. You know, there are times where I really wish we had a physical, naturally conscious community space. There might be a dream for the future, but I would love like an international center that is the naturally conscious community, because I would love a gallery space that we could host so many of these types of exhibits and exhibitions, because I feel like we could have such fascinating conversations around them where, yeah, if you go to a museum and you see them, they're cool, but they don't really give you that place where you can have these discussions with a group like ours that has an online component where we really get to know each other. And then we could have this physical experiment so we can really have the deeper conversation. We can go into what is really life or death when we're thinking about it from a diatome perspective and how that relates to human life or death or human harm and survival. I mean, come on, let's just be honest. We would have fascinating conversations about this. We would just be sitting around chatting nonstop about it um, with every single exhibit. Um, in conversation with Catriona Sandilands, we discuss the genealogy and affordances of the vegetal turn in the humanities and arts. The interview foregrounds feminist engagement with ra uh, racialized and gendered violence of botanical colonialisms while proposing a methodology for feminist science and technology studies interested in plant members. Thinking the feminist vegetal turn in the shadow of Douglas first. By the way, we already discussed this particular paper, this discussion. So you can go in to the, um, the replay. So you can go into the recording section the, um, and you can find this one. It's called Thinking of the Feminist Vegetal Turn in the Shadow of Douglas Firs. I think it's a two-parter. So you're going to have to go into it and look at it in a two-parter. It gives the idea of general about the emergence of critical plant studies as a diverse field. It also brings together literacy, historical, and matter, material examples of human vegetal ecologies. It is a very, very interesting paper, um, very interesting discussion and interview. 
The critical perspective section curated by feminist scientists. So like I said, this is an introduction because this is an entire section of this, of this journal, Catalyst, that has been dedicated to these. So they're another talking about what all these different papers are, which for us are interesting to know that these exist. So the critical pers perspective section curated by feminist scientist studies and legal scholar brings together, Laura Foster, brings together six scholars exploring the deep interconnections between plants, science, and race in settler colonial settings. While, uh, while Krisha J. Hernandez proposes to engage with the more than human terminology as a way to co-create indigenous future rights. Yeah. Sarah Ives warns against the slippage between more than human and less than human modalities that shape the multi-species world. I hate the term more than human. More than human, less than human, I find this term other than human, I get. I don't love it, but I get it because we have this focus on humans and this is, or the non-human world, I get, but more than human and less than human, me no like. Um, in a similar vein, Elaine Gann shows how race is co-produced in crop science classification of rice varieties and in plantation regimes, regimes that subordinate human laborers' bodies. Lastly, Diana Gibson invites us to learn from Kana plants alongside the indigenous ways of knowing and being of the Khoi and the Sands peoples. While William Ellis portrays milkwood trees in South Africa as witnesses to colonial violence of slave trade, executions, and mass logging for building settler infrastructures. This whole idea of plants as witnesses is really fascinating. I worked on a proposal that unfortunately wasn't accepted for a, um, for a project at Auschwitz. It was right across the entrance of Auschwitz. And in, we had proposed a type of um, a center that was built into the canopy of the trees that were there that were witness to the horrors that happened in Auschwitz and, and everything. So we thought it was extremely important to engage the, um, the actual plants and the trees in particular in the mourning process and the grieving process and the processing process of people. Because right now in Auschwitz, from what I understand, when you go, you walk out and there is nothing for you to like, like you're overcome by grief, by, by horror, by so many different elements. And there is nothing there to comfort you, to give you space, to give you time to process. And we really wanted to build a center and a space across from it that would do that. I was working with an Austrian architect on this project. It's a beautiful project. It's such a shame that it wasn't accepted. I don't know if anything else was accepted. Hopefully it was. They're, they're trying to build a peace center there. But for us, a peace center was something that needed to have space for grieving. Um, the theme of botanical colonialism continues in Zan Sara Shako's Hope I got that right. Contribution to this collection. Recording the recent institutional rebranding of botanical gardens as the hubs for global biodiversity conservation through investing in seed banking in the face of environmental crisis. Drawing on Michelle Murphy's notions of econ economization of life, digging up colonial roots, the less known origins of the Millennium Seed Bank Partnership problematizes the forgetting of accused gardens colonial legacy and the garden's central role in the imperial economy, which persists in the seed bank partnership project as it is imagined as a repository for securing botanical futures. As Landa Schimbinger reminds us, the 1600 botanical gardens that Europeans have founded worldwide by the end of the 18th century were not merely idyllic bits of green intended to delight city dwellers but environmental stations for agriculture as a way station for plant acclimatization for domestic and global trading. Going back to the fact that all our house plants were once tropical plants. Rare medicaments and cash crops. Together, these critical perspectives on plants, race, and colonialism forge new pathways for feminist decolonial and indigenous technoscience. Through stories of plant-human encounters, this collection of articles and, provo and uh, provocations poses questions around practices of knowledge production that weave the vegetal life into scientific, biotechnological, and medical discourses, histories, and practices. Our proposed title, Plantarium, posed some technical difficulties. Tax editing software were persistently changed to Planetarium in the act of disciplining this weedy term. Never, I love that, in the act of disciplining this weedy term. 
Nevertheless, we welcome this confusion as a foreshadowing our multidimensional perspectives on uneasy plant-human relations. We need to coin new words. We need new words. We need new words that will help bring us into a new paradigm. So you coin away all the new words you want to coin away. Um, relations rooted in concrete stories that reveal local botanical knowledge while reflecting the planetary consciousness, driving the commodification of vegetal matter and colonial expansion and domination. As plants determine in concrete, empirical ways, human livelihoods, diet, health, landscape, urban design, and economies, and grow into our histories of belonging, domination, and conquest, they allow a multi-species understanding of human knowledge as co-produced by plants. What we understand as planetarium, as plantarium, excuse me, I almost said planetarium, plantarium also shares kinship with herbarium, a collection of pressed plants. This practice of selecting and arranging specimens in two-dimensional archives is ubiquitous for botanical taxonomy. Our selection of plant-inspired essays, conversations, and provocations offers a critical feminist commentary on this very cornerstone of scientific endeavor while attending to complex entanglements of race, ethnicity, class, sexuality, nationality, and colonialism. Through questioning and crossing the taxonomic boundaries and normative classifications, this botanical, uh, this botanical thought troubles classical notions of identity, subjectivity, life, environment, nature, and culture, and sprouts into territories of politically valiant social struggles, whereas herbariums necessarily feature the materiality of the individual plants themselves, as singular specimens represent types. This collection presents both empirical and theoretically anchored essays that, for, that foreground vegetal ecologies as material semiotic relationships. We hope that plantarium will germinate new pathways for feminist, decolonial, and indigenous ways of thinking with plants. That was pretty interesting. I don't know about you, but I thought that was really interesting. Um, so, let me go back to the top so we have the name. So that was the introduction to this special section, which is called Plantarium, Human Vegetal Ecologies. It was published in 2019 in Catalyst. I'll provide a link when I do the, um, the final kind of uh, the replay of this. But I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Like, I really want to hear what you think about these types of um, this type of thinking, these types of arguments, the whole concept of where we're moving in this critical plant studies, what is critical plant studies, how important is critical plant studies, what are the cultural meanings and the functional context. Like, I just wanna hear it all. I wanna hear what you thought, I wanna hear what it is. So you could of course always post in, um, in Sprout discussions and we can have a discussion about this. You can wait until I post this in the replay section, which will be um, there for you to find. And then, then you can easily kind of just add your comment. Like, I just want to hear it all because I feel like this is, this is the future of our discussions. I, like I said at the very beginning, um, I think that we as NCC have done an amazing job of bringing this into the daily aspect where this is still looking at it from an overall global perspective and from um so it's just to the macro and the micro i think we've done an excellent job of looking at it, things in the micro and these types of papers are taking us into new realms of the macro but i do think that both of them are important and i'm here to help you bridge these two because we need to pull from the macro contexts in order for us to really modify the micro or the physical aspects of what we live i mean these paradigm shifts are important and they are extremely important for the type of society and life, not just from a climate change perspective, which, hey man, all power to it, it's a very important discussion we need to have. So climate change, but also decolonization, indigenous knowledge, like really bringing us into a new rapport with the natural world. Um, I was looking at uh, the nature briefings today and they came in and they were saying that our consumers and the amount of materialism that we as humans require and it's becoming required for us is so gross that gross in the amount like so big that the world really is having a it's starting to cough through the the chest pains you could say of having all of this weight 
on the earth. So we are not going to be able to sustain this type of life. And we can't just change minds by telling people stop spending, stop, stop consuming, stop creating more material. What we need to do is enter into a completely different relationship with our natural selves, with our natural intelligence, with our, our inner sense of being and our outer sense of being. So our inner plantness and our outer plantness. And I think that this is really what's going to push us into completely new realms. So I want to hear your thoughts and your discussions. You know, please pop them into a post or again, put them in as a comment. But, you know, I'm here talking about all this because I want to see us make this change that I know we're all capable. And each one of you that is watching this has one little piece that your life purpose, one little piece of this puzzle. And I want to help you make sure that that piece of the puzzle gets put into the overall puzzle of this cosmic game of life that we're playing. So at any point, if you have any questions or comments, things that you want me to address, or if you're really looking for support in order to help you reach this new level, this new paradigm shift that you want to reach for your life and for, in reality, the life of all of humanity, then I am here for you. All you have to do is reach out to me. So that's it. Um, one quick announcement, just in case you haven't seen it, please, actually, it's multiple announcements, but roped into one announcement, which is go check out the recent posts in Sprout's discussion, because there's lots of important and good stuff coming up. We have um, I Am Plants coming back on October 2nd. So the 2nd through the 6th of October will be our five-day challenge to reflect your true nature and embody your plantness. Um, which is coming back with, as always, new material, new concepts, new explorations that we're going to go into, and we're going to really expand on everything that we have done in I Am Plant in the past. Then there is your Nurture Your Nature retreat. It looks like there are now two posts, two spots left for our 2024 uh, spring retreat, which is coming to Dom and Her for five days. So if you're interested, in exploring that, all of that is in the comments. And other than that, I'm here. So please resist the urge, resist the urge to block your evolving green brilliance. That's me, Tigrega Denia. Happy weekend, everyone. And we will see each other again next week. Bye.